Hello guys, it's Carbon Rhino and I have a super special guest here with me. Uh, it's according to me and I think a lot of other people, the most well-known Greek game designer. It's Vagelis Bayatakis. Hi Vagelis, how are you? Hi Lenny, nice to be here. It's great to have you here as well. Uh, as you guys know, I'm also Greek, so this is a very special interview and we're going to talk with Vagelis about um, a game that has a Greek historical theme behind it. It's Freedom. Uh, it was designed by Vagelis, I think, a couple of years back, right? It's, uh, uh, a few more than that. <laughs> a few more than that. that, right. Yes, yes. But it was released, um, it was released yes, years uh, back by Falmouth. Yeah. It was released in 2020. It was kickstarted the one year right. earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, and it's uh, a card driven war game about the, the siege of Mesologi. And um, well, I, I would like to first of all ask you before we, we go into like what the game is about, like um, how was the, the, the process of designing it? I have like a, a question for you because I, I've seen like you've designed, designed very different games, like from Fields of Green to Kitchen Rush and Among the Stars. And I think this is your first war game. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. How, how did you decide to design a war game in the first place? So first of all, I, I really like the idea of trying different genres and uh, different types of games. I mean, yeah. you see very often some designers, they stick to a certain type of games. They, they're good at it. They mm -hmm. design very good games. Uh, and usually they stay there in, around that territory. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to experiment and, you know, uh, dip my toe into different uh, types mm -hmm. of games. So I've designed, as you said, some, you know, strategy games, like some family games. Uh, I've done some party games and uh, uh, even a dexterity game with a wooden board. I mean, I've tried a lot of different things. And uh, so at some point when I, this idea for this game came up, I knew that, okay, this is something very different from anything else I've designed. Why not? Let's try that. Let's try designing a war game. So you and, basically challenged yourself or something yeah, like that? I mean, the idea with this game was uh, I, I didn't I didn't start by saying okay I want to design a war game what war game do I want to design it was the other way around I mean uh, I I happened to be uh, about ten years ago mm -hmm. uh, I was watching a play regarding uh, Masalogi it was uh, during our Independence Day 25th uh -huh. of March and uh, it was a child's play. And uh, it, it had to do with the seeds of Mesologi. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was watching it, uh, I, at some point they said that uh, Karaiskaki is a very famous, as you know, oh, no. uh, Greek oh. hero, was about to help with uh, near the end of the siege. Uh, but he fell ill and he didn't make it. He didn't, during the, the sortie in mm -hmm. the last days of the siege, he didn't manage to come and help. And in my mind, this sounded like somebody had just played an event card, like, right. <laughs> like this. And totally. it was then what yeah. struck me, like, okay, you have two very distinct functions here, uh, two distinct parts. Uh, you have a very nice setting, very in interesting story behind it. And I realized that this could very easily turn into a game. And, mm -hmm. it, and I mean, I would see other games around other, you know, historical events or famous battles. And I, I had seen those things and I was saying to myself, like, why not this one? This this would really make a very good game. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to start working on it. And uh, I found the guy that wrote the play who had uh, read a lot of books about uh, the Siege of Mesologi. Yeah. And he helped me with the historical part with, uh, you know, information oh, regarding... Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Because he had done a lot of reading, and it was very useful for me, you know, to whatever I need, I could just ask him. So it saved me all the time to do all the right. reading myself. <laughs> Although great. I, I ended up reading a yeah. lot of things myself too. 
but uh, it was very nice to have him on board and easily ask him questions and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so th that was the initial plan but it took us a few years to <laughs> to start actually working on it and, uh, um, yes. so, yeah the the game I know it's it's an asymmetrical game where one player plays the besieged uh, freedom fighters the, the Greeks and the other player is the um, besieging imperial forces correct mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. um i think uh once I, I guess one starting point to design the game must have been the the geographical location of the the mesologi right like yeah. the um, can you it play the part us? yes it was because one of the reasons that uh mesologi was uh, very you know it was the target of this siege it was because it was a very strategic point mm -hmm. um, when the rebellion started in greece uh, it was initially let's say liberated it was revolted so they tried to the ottomans tried to take it back and uh this was actually the third siege that was attempted uh, at mesologi there mm -hmm. were two more sieges but they both failed and they didn't last long either either of them uh, and uh, so this was, at this point, the, the Sultan uh, was very angry with the fact that this, the city was uh, under Greek control. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he asked one of his generals, uh, uh, Kitahi, as you know, and he said, take Mesologi or I take your head. So <laughs> it was something like this. So Big incentive. <laughs> he was very determined to take the city <laughs> because he knew what was on the line. And uh, initially, it seemed like it was going to be an easy task because when Kitahi went for the third time on the Sologi, he brought a huge army with him. Uh, the first two sieges, uh, the army was uh, much smaller. Um, the first one was again by Kitahi, the second was by another general. But they both had uh, brought very more forces so they, they weren't much of a threat mm -hmm. also between the, the first sieges and the third one uh, the people within the city had uh, fortified their walls even better they had made some fortifications mm -hmm. and uh, they had improved uh, you know the defense of the city so when Kitahis uh, went for the third time he brought a huge army with him and he expected that the whole thing would be over in a matter of you know, weeks at, at most. Mm -hmm. And uh, after six months, he still couldn't take the city. And that was when uh, uh, the Sultan asked help from uh, uh, from the Egyptian uh, Pasha, I think, who sent uh, uh, who sent his son, the the Prince uh, Ibrahim, and uh, when. When he arrived at Mesologi, his reaction was also the same. He said, like, come on, if you can't take this fence, mm, that was his right. work. Like, right. You can't go over this fence. And he, he also thought that it would be an easy task. And yet, he also had trouble getting into the city. And um, so this went back and forth for a few months more. Yeah. And the sheet basically lasted for a year. I mean, about six months after Ibrahim came, he realized that he could not enter into the city by force. He tried from the walls, he couldn't do it. He tried from the lagoon, which was also, as we, as we said before, that it was very strategically well-placed city because it had the they had natural defenses. A, a big part of the city was uh, covered, let's say, by the lagoon. So it was hard for the for the Ottomans to get inside the city from the lagoon. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually tried a lot of times. Uh, so near about one year after the siege had started, they had decided to let the people starve because they had managed to blockade everything. Nobody could get into the city to bring supplies. And uh, in the end, the, the, the city, let's say, fell because the people couldn't uh, uh, couldn't stand the, the hunger anymore, and they were uh, starved to death. They were actually starving; they were dying to death. Yeah. So they decided to do the sortie, 
which is well known as you know <laughs> in Greece, mm -hmm. and uh, to leave the city. Uh, unfortunately for them, that plan was betrayed, and it turned into a massacre as as they were leaving the city. And they were determined not to not to surrender. They said, "Okay, we can't take it anymore. We're leaving. We will we'll, we'll try to go out with a bank. We uh, will attempt to leave during the night uh, with forces, you know, shooting our way out and go, get to the nearby mountain." But their plan was betrayed. It was also a full moon during that night, so there, there was a lot of light, and the Ottomans could see them clearly. And uh, in the end, it turned into a massacre. Very few people survived from those uh, trying to leave the city, and um, most of the people captured ended up uh, being uh, uh, traded as slaves and uh, sold into into Africa into slavery. Uh, is the the betrayal part uh, part of the game? Or? Uh, no, actually, uh, while I was discussing this while I was designing the game, along with my friend who uh, would provide me all the historical info, one question that we would keep on you know bringing up was whether we could put the sorte into the game, mm -hmm. uh, the, because it was a big part of what actually happened. But the, the problem was that. Essentially, the sortie happens after the Greeks, let's say, they lose. They, they, they can't stand any longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was hard to put it in gameplay-wise. So we left it at that. We left it that uh, basically the game ends either with uh, the Ottomans winning and not... Uh, right. uh, and either by entering the city or by the morale falling. Uh, or the Greeks will, after some time has passed, and the Ottomans decide to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, the the odd thing is that uh, Ibrahim had stated that if the siege had lasted a couple of weeks more, they would also have left, because mm -hmm. the Ottoman forces also couldn't stand it. They had to eat as well. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was it was a mercenary army. They had to pay you know, mm -hmm. for the soldiers they had. They had to feed them. And their morale was also very, very low because it was more than a year that they were trying to, wow. to take this. Yeah. So it was very close, and that was actually what another thing that you know made me realize that this could turn into a game because it was very close mm -hmm. to the actual outcome. Yeah. So, yeah. so it wasn't a stretch for the Greeks to win or for the uh, Ottomans to win as it actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the irony, if you like, is that even though the Greeks, in a way, they lost, uh, what happened, the events of the sortie and the massacre that happened after the Ottomans entered the city, uh, moved everyone in Europe very much and actually turned uh, a lot of people towards the Greek side mm -hmm. of uh, the coast. And uh, a lot of the grand powers in Europe around the time decided to help Greece in their fight for independence. Mm -hmm. So despite this being technically a loss, it actually paved the way for the independence of Greece. So that's why it has a huge uh, significance. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I guess the name is uh, based on the, the slogan of uh, the, the Greek uh, wars uh, or rebellion um, freedom yeah, or freedom. death, or death, yes. okay, okay, all right. Um, and actually, uh, at some point, we one of the games that I was considering early on was uh, the free besieged, which is actually, uh, yes, yes, Greek. yes, as you know, this is the name that a very famous poet, poem, very yeah. Greek poet. yeah, that's the name he gave to one of his poems that was about mesology, right? That people were besieged but they were effectively free because their spirit was free. Yes, yes, exactly. So. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you, we haven't really spoken about the mechanics of the game, but maybe you could tell us what is your favorite mechanic in the game? Or what was the, the first thing that you started building upon? Or like, how... So, it as, as this was a siege, the very first 
thought mm -hmm. came to my mind was that there would be a truck of, uh, uh, you know, with the food that the people would need to consume every round. And uh, when this, you would also have a truck with the morale. And uh, when uh, there was no, every round you would need to spend food. And if you ever reached the end of the truck, instead of food, you would lose morale. So mm -hmm. that's how I, that was the very, very first mechanic that I thought. Right. And this remained in the game up until the end. Um, beyond that, I, I really liked the, the card driven mechanism. Uh, even though I hadn't played a, a, a huge amount of war games when I started designing uh, the game, one game that I had really enjoyed was uh, 1960, 1960, The Making of the President, oh, uh, which okay. is about the elections in, uh, in the US with Nixon and Kennedy. Mm -hmm. So that was also a card-driven game, and a lot of people call it a war game in disguise. Instead of units, you have uh, votes. Like right. So I really, really loved, when I was playing that game, the fact that you had these cards with, uh, they were very thematic. They had actual events that transpired, and you could either play the card for the depicted event, something would happen that would simulate what happened in reality, or you could discard the card and use those action points to do other things. So mm -hmm. it gave you the liberty to do what you wanted, but it could also help you with, you know, something uh, related to that event. And uh, I really love li love that mechanism. Uh, I thought that it would help uh, bring a, uh, bring the theme into the surface. I mean, to make people learn about what happened, and uh, it was a chance to put actual events. Uh, into the game. Mm -hmm. So this was the other thing that right from the start I decided that this was how I wanted the game to, to work. With actual events, actual people, uh, mm -hmm. personalities that took place during uh, the siege. And you would have the chance to use those people, to uh, use those events as they happened, or to change history and do something different. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, what has been the biggest challenge in designing this game? Because I guess there's a lot of different moving parts and there must be something that was really difficult for you to do, I guess. So, I don't know. Uh, there are actually there are two things that I consider the, the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, one was that uh, the balance. So, this is an asymmetric uh, game. So. Uh, each side has different actions, has different goals, or trying to do different things. So when designing an asymmetric game, um, it's not very easy to get the balance exactly where, uh, uh, you know, at the perfect point, because uh, it depends a lot on the player. Well, one player may play, one of the sides may be more easy to play, the other may be more tricky. Uh, it helps if you know the cards. So. During playtesting, you needed both experienced players playing the game again and again, uh, as well as new players trying the game for the first time. And, you know, okay, I was watching and trying to see, okay, where is the uh, the exact balance? Where do you, is the point that you say, okay, both players have an equal chance and it's entirely up to them and how well they play. Uh, in the end, I think that <laughs> we managed to name this part and it's also... I mean, uh, every now and then I will hear people say that, okay, this side is uh, much better than the other one. And at the same time, I will see posts uh, uh, claiming the other thing, the, the opposite thing, that the other side is better. And uh, for people that have played a lot of games, the, their comments are that it's actually balanced and they have an equal number of wins with either side. Uh, the other challenge when I was designing the game was... Um, how much do I put into the game, considering what actually happened? I mean, how many things do I transfer into the game? And where, where do I stop? It was like a complexity versus, um, let's say, simulation of what actually happened. Nice. Because there were things that were initially in the game when I started designing, and that at some point uh, I decided to, to remove them because while interesting and uh, true to historical accuracy, they weren't offering that much gameplay-wise. Mm -hmm. For example, around the walls, there was a moat 
that some parts were filled with water, some parts weren't. And initially that was also a part of the game, like you could uh, perform an action to fill the moat with water and make it harder for the Ottomans to, to get in. The Ottomans could also perform an action to empty the water, to, to remove the water. So you had these kind of uh, things that were based on actual historical events. Uh, in a way, they were interesting, but they, uh, they were adding more complexity to the game, which was uh, usually you try to find the balance between, you know, interesting versus uh, too complex. You don't want the game to be too complex, uh, nor do you want to make it too simple and lose interest. So mm -hmm. that was another balance that we were, I was trying to achieve. And uh, how long did it take you from starting to design the game until the moment you said, okay, now it's good to go? Or if you, like, I don't know if designers actually say that, because I think over time you'll find something that you probably want to change. But how long did the um, um, designing oh, and the development part uh, last? Well, the core of the game, uh, so the idea came in uh, like 2010, I think that was when the idea first came. Mm -hmm. But we actually started working on the game on 2014. So it was four years afterwards. Okay. Uh, right. The game was in my mind, but you know, not something very concrete, just random thoughts here and there. Mm -hmm. So on 2014, uh, along with Alexander, this friend of mine, we started uh, you know, putting our ideas down on paper and it took roughly a year to put, you know, the basic game to, to create it. So, but not with, we weren't uh, meeting every day, like it was mm -hmm. uh, one or once or twice a week, but it took about a year with that uh, rate. Without uh, the development part, I'm guessing. Yeah, the development came afterwards, you right. know, with more tweaking, play testing, and uh, okay, so this card we probably need to change it, okay, let's change this card, let's add this one, uh, I need another effect, or okay, let's see, so how many cards do I have that do this sort of thing here, how many cards on the other side, that was the development part that came afterwards, mm -hmm. and this took, uh, this wasn't a, you know, a specific period of time, because mm -hmm. as I was trying, you know, to find the publisher, then I was, uh, uh, while we, I was waiting for the publisher, uh, I, I would do fewer playtests. Then when it was, uh, Phalanx decided to publish it, uh, I did some more playtests, I did some more development for the game. So uh, at that, after that point, it was you know, varying degrees of time and uh, effort. Right, okay. Um... I was just wondering, have you ever played uh, Freedom with um, any of your kids? I, I think they're they're very young now, uh, right? Yeah, they're very young. The, the, the oldest one, basically all of them have shown interest because they've mm -hmm. seen the cover of the game, they want to play it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of them you know, are too young to play it yet. The uh, older one could probably play it, but with the game being in English so far, Right. Not as easy for him. Right. Uh, hopefully, as soon as the, the Greek version is uh, uh, goes forward with the production, uh, we'll be able to. Oh, there will be a Greek version. Yes, and uh, so great. actually, at the, at the moment, uh, as, as you may know, Phalanx has a, a pre-ordering page where you can, mm -hmm. people can pre-order the reprint for the English version. And oh, there are also uh, plans for other languages as well. There is also for the Greek version, German one, Polish, uh, Spanish, and um, they use a system like P2, P200. So as soon as 200 pre-orders are made for the game, uh, the production uh, moves forward. So oh, okay. as soon as uh, some pre-orders are made, uh, we're probably going to see a great version as well, and I really look forward to it. Great, yeah. I'll have a link to the um to the Kickstarter page in the description below for anyone who wants to check it out. And uh, it would be great if it was in Greek because I'm thinking that this kind of game would actually make um, like students uh, in, in 
high schools or uh, secondary schools and stuff more excited about history because like the, the way they learn it at school is not that much exciting but if they got to play the game i think it would get them really you know excited about board games and about uh uh the history as well so i hope one of one of the very you know exciting things about this game is that you actually feel like the people involved in the siege were feeling at that time so right. initially you see the the Ottoman player, the Imperial player, comes with a huge army. So you feel very confident. You feel like I have all those units here. I mean, it's going to be easy. And uh, the, the great player, uh, the insurgents, they are more cautious. Like, okay, let's see how this goes. As a few rounds go by, the, the great player sees that it's he can defend the city, like he can hold it. So his confidence goes up while the Imperial player sees his units dying one by one. He doesn't have a lot of uh, forces, right. so it, it actually seems like it's it's going to be an easy win for the insurgents. At that point, it's where Ibrahim comes in and with uh, Egyptian troops. So he brings in more troops. He brings on better uh, cannon operators, and so he brings a, a fresh air to the besiegers. And things start suddenly to become harder for the for the insurgents. Mm -hmm. uh, another problem they were facing it was that due to the fact that the city was holding, a lot of people from the nearby areas would go into the city to protect themselves. But this meant that there were more mouths to feed inside the city. Right. Okay. So the problem was the trade off. Yeah. Right. And so after a point, it starts to become really hard for the Greek players to, to manage everything. They have fewer units. Uh, they may At that point, they may have very few units to defend the wall. On the other hand, the Imperial player at some point also has, uh, his morale is very low. He doesn't have a lot of uh, money to, to, pro, to supply, for supplies and for salaries for his units. So near the end of the game, round five or six, both sides, they are, both feeling like helpless, like it's very close. Who is going to win? How, how are we going to survive? And both are trying to get, you know, they're hanging by every chance they can get. Mm -hmm. to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just a bit longer. Right. So it's great because so playing the game, you actually learn a lot of things about what happened mm -hmm. through, you know, having fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The game. Mm -hmm. so as you said, it's a perfect tool to. To teach somebody that part of history. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, are there any plans for, I don't know, expansions maybe? Or not yet? It's not something you're... Uh, so at, at the point, at this point, not exactly an expansion. Uh, I have at the back of my mind uh, a solo version for the Ottomans. I mean, ah. right now there is a solo version where the insurgents are being played by an AI. Mm -hmm. There is actually this version that has been published. Uh, it works really well because it, uh, you know, the insurgents, they, were, they are more like reacting to what the Imperials are doing. So uh, it's easy to, to have an AI control the, the Greek side, so you can play the game solo. Uh, what some players have asked for is a, a solo version where there is an AI for the Ottomans. So this. I haven't worked on it yet, but it is in the back of my mind, and I hope that someday I'll be able to work on that too. Okay, all right. Um, I also have a question. It's not so much related to freedom, but to game design in general, because I think uh, most gamers, or like a big percentage of board gamers, they are into game design, and, and like a, a big percentage is an aspiring game designer, I think. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you if you have any advice or tips for new game designers, stuff that they can, like they should avoid or where to focus on or where not to focus on. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's probably of, a, a bigger discussion, but yeah. like, uh, you know, like the, the SOS things, like the, the most important. So I would start that I think the very first thing that the game is 
an aspiring game designer should do mm -hmm. would be to play a lot of games. Uh, right. The more games you play, the better designer you'll be, because mm -hmm. playing a lot of games lets you see how other player, how other people solve some issues, how they transfer some things into mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this guy did this to simulate uh, this battle, or this uh, the payment of salaries, or the uh, resource gathering, whatever. So, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and exactly design. you see. If you play just five games and you want to design one of your own, mm -hmm. you're going to be based on those five games you have that you've played. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it with people that have played, for example, just Monopoly. And when they are asked, when they you suggest to them that they design a game, they design a Monopoly clone effectively yeah. because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's their experience. That's what they've seen. It's, right. It makes perfect sense. If somebody has played a hundred games then he has a much larger pool to get things from and yeah uh, so as you can see and somebody having played 1000 games has an even larger pool so mm -hmm. uh, the more games you played uh, the easier it's going to be for you to design one of your own and uh, the other thing that you should know is that your first game is probably going to suck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not I, I don't want to say this in a you know demeaning way, but it's the in, I think this is in every art, in every craft. Like the first time you try to do something, you're going to fail or you're not going to do it so well. That's perfectly okay. You keep doing it again and again. Yeah, and you again. take it out of your system, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So one advice that they say to new designers is uh, try to design your first ten, ten games as quickly as possible to get them out of the way. So that you can start designing your good ones afterwards. Right. And uh, so yeah, the play a lot of games and design mm -hmm. a lot of games. Do things, work on games. Don't hold on to an idea of yours and try to make it the best it can be. And I guess uh, I guess try to do the prototyping early on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another key word phrase that it's used a lot is, is fail faster. Like right. create yeah. a prototype, yeah. play test it. Okay, a lot of things won't work. All right, so uh, correct them, fix them, uh, try again. Okay, yeah. some things will fail. You correct them, you try again. It's an iterative process. Like you keep doing this, you think of something, you play test it, you change it. Mm -hmm. uh, you play test it, you change, you play test mm -hmm. it, you get feedback. This is this is what we do. And you should probably find the right group of people to get feedback from. And not with anybody. That's another big discussion, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you have. Uh, it's very easy to fall into another trap to mm -hmm. play a game with your friends and family, for example, and uh, usually they're going to say, "Oh, you've designed a game. It's great." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, because it's not that they're doing it on purpose. They are happy for for what you're doing, mm -hmm. but they are not good judges on what right. they're doing. Yes. Uh, yeah. The best thing is to have somebody with uh, absolutely no personal connection to you mm -hmm. play the game because right. he will give you blunt feedback and that's what you need. Mm -hmm. You need somebody to come and tell you, hey, your baby is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> you need that's to very good to hear, I guess. <laughs> it hurts a lot, but you learned that you realized at some point that this is what you need to hear in order for you to improve the game. Because right. if you don't hear this during the design phase, you're going to hear it after the game comes out and people mm -hmm. are not going to like it and it's better yeah. to hear it early on and mm. ch do changes to your game and make it better than to hear it afterwards. Okay, all right. That was uh, really good. Thank you so much for your advice, for your time, for everything. Thank you um, for having me. <laughs> if uh, anyone wants to check out the game, I'll have the link in the description. Um, uh, you also see a lot of uh, footage of the game, it's actually gorgeous, so go check it out. Uh, thank you so much, Magelis, and I hope to have another discussion at some point about like more the nitty-gritty of uh, game design, I hope, at some point. I'll be happy to. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. <laughs>